Hi, everyone. And welcome to the third part in our series about recruiting and retaining uh, young adults into the SCA. Uh, I am Baroness Cat, the current landed Baroness of the Barony of the Steps, which is in Dallas. Uh, and I have been uh, field promoted to moderator of this panel uh, tonight. So we, we decided to replace a cat with a cat. Uh, I would like to let our other panelists go ahead and introduce themselves. So right here to my, my left, we can start. Oh, that's me. Hi, I am Baron Lynn. I am the other half of the Baron of Seth. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I'll work on my intro next time. Yeah. <laughs> I am Lady Valka. I'm the social media officer, and I'm also from Steps. I'm Lord Magnus. Uh, I live in Steps also, and uh, I'm a heavy fighter. I'm Master Miles Ridley because apparently we're using titles, and I live in Bjornsburg, and I'm a rapier fighter. You're muted. You're muted. I'm Leandra Forte. I'm from Brinkalod. Awesome. So the last time we all got together and talked, uh, we focused on uh, recruiting and retaining college age members. Um, and we want to move forward just a little bit and talk about recent grads and folks uh, who may be still in grad school and how we can best meet their needs as a, as a society. Um, so I know that most of the folks here on the panel are recent grads, and I know one thing that happens pretty frequently um, once folks graduate from college is that they move to a new area. Um, could you all talk a little bit about some of the challenges that people face when moving from one SCA group to another and uh, some things that we can better do to help me meet those needs? You probably had a big move. Yeah, so I just, uh, a year ago, I moved from uh, Sea Winds, which is the Cor Corpus Christi area, up to Steps, which is Dallas. And uh, something I had done before that to help is I got in contact with a lot of the people up in the region, uh, spent a lot of time traveling, had friends help me get in contact with people. So it was a big help to have people help you, uh, help me contact people in the area. So I, by the time I moved up here, I already had been up here to a few practices, been up here and kind of had already had a, an idea of who I was going to be training with and working with. So I, you know, that prior planning and talking to people in your area, hey, I'm going to be moving from this city to this city. Do you know anyone there? Can you get in contact, get me in contact with them? I think would be a, a really good starting spot to do that, you know, a couple months beforehand and see if on your time off one weekend, go up to where you're going to be, go up to one of their practices when, when we start doing that again and uh, kind of already have a plan, have a plan before you move up there. Would be a, is what I did, and I, I, what I would advise everyone to do. I don't know if any of you guys have experience. I moved here after I graduated and then joined the SCA after, so it wasn't really moving from one group to the next. Um, but recent college grads and graduate students don't really have a ton of money. So just being aware of that and uh, you know, not expecting them to dedicate their whole life to something right after they just went through a major life change, just allowing them to be casual players, um, helping them out by giving them rides and stuff. A big help for me was that my now knight at the time was just a friend, which let me get in his truck every time he was going to an event so I could get free rides to events. Yeah, same. Um, that was like definitely really big for me having uh, people who could offer me rides places. And also like, like you said, I didn't, I don't have a ton of money. I didn't have a ton of money then when I was starting out. And so people offering me like hospitality, like I didn't have my own, you know, tent to set up or whatever, like loaning me things to make it possible for me to go to events. And also like Miles loaned me uh, his sword so that I could start fencing. And, uh, you know, several of my other friends let me like barb and a mask and all that stuff. So like making it low stakes for starting out, making sure that you have um, things for the hospital or to give out um, is like really, really important because it's a very expensive hobby. And so making it like low stakes, easy to get into, easy to play casually 
without a huge investment up front is definitely important. Like if you just got out of college and just moved a whole bunch. Yeah, I, I think what you said there is really important, making space for casual players. What are some ways that we can we can work on that and, and make that a priority? Uh, I can talk a little bit just from the heavy, uh, as a, for heavy fighters. Uh, I tell people, uh, and I try to get my friends to come out and stuff, I've uh, gotten a few friends involved. I say, the only thing you need is a cup, athletic cup. Go get yourself an athletic cup from, I know it's a little different, y'all can speak on uh, rapier, but for heavy, just get an athletic cup, come out, and bring, uh, and then we have everything. I think it's important to have, uh, you know, the loner armor ready, you know, well-protected loner armor uh, and something. Because when I first started, I used loner armor for, I didn't, God, I must have not had my first piece of armor until a couple months in when I bought a little bit of leather and started piecing together some arms. So, you know, keeping it low stakes, you know, if you say, hey, you got to come spend a couple hundred dollars to get you entry, you know, that's not going to be good for anyone, especially for, recent college grads that, you know, are trying to pay off these loans, get everything together, get everything situated. So you got to keep it at low stakes, uh, making sure that there's uh, well-protected loaner armor and that they can come out and uh, have a fun time, start off easy, which is uh, a good way to keep heavy fighters coming back. Yeah, and to build on that is having gear that will fit everybody. So most groups just have gear that will fit people that are Magnus's size which is usually fine because he's six foot three and the average SCA heavy fighter is six foot three. But when I joined, they did, they had no gear that fit me. Um, luckily, Sir Floki was able to go home and get his gear and bring it and I got to fight. And uh, Duke Sven loaned me his Lady Antigone's helmet, so I did get to fight in my first practice, but it was not in my Baroness loaner gear. Um, so when you're telling people, you know, all you need to bring is your cup, make sure that you actually have stuff for them. Like I'm five, six, I'm not that small. I'm bigger than your average woman. Um, but if we want small fighters and female fighters and fighters who are not just average size, you need to have stuff for everybody. And uh, it's fairly easy to make. Like my armor, once I got it made, essentially I knew that I was gonna stay in fight. So I just put effort into building armor right away because um, my barony didn't have any, but we can't expect every woman to come do that. So just get some pickle barrel, make like a small, medium and large, an extra large, it's like 15 bucks per pickle barrel. Um, and that way when they show up, you can be like, here, put this on, like swing a sword, have fun. Uh, without having to be like, oh, sorry, you don't have anything to fit you. Yeah, I, I think I those have, are- I was just gonna say I had a very similar thing and like I didn't even, I had one piece of armor going into my first war um, and like one piece of garb total. Um, going into my first event, which was Pentic. And then um, I think I'd done the three events past that. And I was always wearing uh, Master Miguel's clothes because <laughs> we're about the same size and he would loan me stuff. Um, but I didn't have like easy access to stuff in our uh, barony really. Um, and I would definitely not have gone to Penzik if it wasn't for like Miguel and the Fonway being like, no, I will find you calls. You can, you can definitely go and play. Uh, I think those are all some really, really good points and really important information. So, so thank you for that. Um, for, for those of you who have recently graduated in the past few years and maybe, you know, not necessarily moved to a different city, how did your gameplay change? as a college student versus a graduate? Yeah, I can go ahead and go. I graduated about three years ago from a place that was about 45 minutes north of Austin. So I was primarily playing in Bringolod. Luckily, I moved back to the city that I grew up in, in San Antonio. So I went there just about every summer and got to know the group beforehand. But I definitely had to change my activity level a little bit and um, have some conversations with people who I was close to and, and talk to them about um, what impacts that was going to have on me. For instance, I kept going to Austin on every Tuesday from San Antonio for a few months after I graduated college. And um, that drive from San Antonio to Austin is terrible. It takes about an hour and a half on a very good day, up to three hours if there's traffic, because you hit San Antonio traffic and Austin traffic. So I was used to going to that practice every Tuesday. And then one time I got there late and I was all pissed off cursing and everything. And, uh, and Mrs. Gwyneth there actually talked to me. She was like, you know, um, 
you know, we love having you here, but if you're going to be upset because it is too difficult for you to get up here, you know, you don't have to come. We value you being happier more than you coming to practice and getting better, all that jazz. It, it doesn't matter if you're not having fun and not being happy. And that came from Gwyneth of all people. She's a workhorse. So shifting that expectation of me recently graduated and her saying, hey, um, we all understand that you've graduated and you've just gone through this change. And it's totally okay if your lifestyle changes a little bit because of that. Um, that gave me the freedom to really just focus on being a young adult and then fitting the SCA into my life instead of focusing on the SCA and trying to fit being a young adult in my life, which is incredibly different. And what people just graduating college need is they need to get their feet under them and, and build that support group and know that everybody's still around and there for them while their habits change from being a college student with a ton of time on their hand when they're bored and used to going to Taco Bell at 3 a.m. and night, doesn't matter when they go home, et cetera, to transitioning and being awake at 8 a.m. or earlier sometimes and moving forward. And that can make somebody very, very grouchy. Me in particular, very grouchy because I like my sleep and I don't like getting up before 8 a.m. And I had to start doing that. And so people were very patient with me through that process and that helped out tremendously. Joanna's laughing because she knows how grouchy I was during that time. <laughs> what Miles said is uh, really like about transitioning from uh, someone in the SCA or somebody who has a lot of time to you know promote to SCA to have to focus on your life. When I uh, was down in, in Sea Winds, I was going to a practice every weekend, uh, sometimes twice a week because I had so much extra time and I was an undergrad. I'm currently in dental school right now and my ability to go out and practice changed dramatically. And I had to, uh, you know, really schedule my time right. And it was, I, you know, took time to go and fight and train as much as I could, but ultimately you need to focus on, you know, in my case, uh, grad school and other, you know, in other cases, your adult, young adult life, and then fit your SCA in this time that way. Because if you do it backwards and you just make SCA the first thing, you're gonna fall behind on, you know, your life and you don't want to do that, then as everything's going to start cycling out of control. So making sure you prioritize, you know, doing life first and then SCA second is a, is a big point. And then as yeah, a local group, just don't jump down their throats. So for example, I moved. Everyone was like, oh, why weren't you at practice? Like I was moving houses, calm down. Yeah, <laughs> um, I definitely had that. Like I um, was, I think the first year that I played, I went to like, almost every event that had rapier for like the full year and I went to you know like two or three different um interkingdom events and I was just like trying to go to everything I could I went to like several practices even in like other baronies and stuff and um then I got a full-time job <laughs> and I work on the weekends and so I was like, oh shit, well, like I have to go to all these events. I have to request off time like all the time. And that's just not really feasible, like realistically, because um, I need money, like I need to pay rent. <laughs> um, and at first, like uh, I felt really, really bad because I was like, well, I'm being like a bad player because I'm only being able to go to like local events. I'm not traveling. Um, like, like she said, you know, they're, there was definitely a little bit of a like um feeling guilt <laughs> and um like bad for putting my life first before my game um and people like kind of shaming me a little bit and I was like well but like I do need to like make money and like um pay for rent so being having friends that like kind of stopped me and were like you need to stop requesting off so much time from work and you need to put like your life priorities first and that's okay like you need to be able to get your feet under you and get like savings and an apartment and you know make sure that your life is situated before you put all this time into the game was really really important having people that would like support me just going to whatever I could um, even if I was playing nowhere near as much as I had started. Yeah, and a good way to support them, for example, is like Magnus moved apartments a couple weeks ago and a bunch of his SCA friends showed up. We got his entire apartment and all his sister stuff moved in in two hours. So like that's something outside of just local practice. You hear like, oh, so-and-so's, you know, moving up here. 
said, oh, how many people do you need to help? Like, we'll show up. Because, like, I know all you people have trailers and trucks. It's <laughs> <laughs> a way to show them that you care and you're here for them without being, well, you need to come to practice or you need to, you know, go to ANS night or whatever it is. Yeah, so the underlying thing that I'm noticing between all these answers is really pertaining to expectations. Um, a lot of times in the SCA, especially at the higher levels with the uh, peerages and grant level orders and people aspiring to be there, um, we put a lot of expectations on people to have a certain attendance in the SCA. And we really subconsciously demand from them that they do that. And it takes a huge toll on people in order to do that. And then they feel bad about not being able to participate at that level where it's really not a requirement if you're gonna play the SCA to go to 27 events a year. But somehow in our culture, sometimes it can feel that way. And especially with this demographic group of people recently graduating from college and trying to establish themselves professionally, figure out their life balance and et cetera, it's okay to let them them be casual, fall in and out and find their way back. If, if they enjoy it, they will find their way back into the SCA. They'll make it a priority in their life. But if you put a bunch of expectation on them, they won't want to find their way back because then they're just feeling bad about not being able to participate and eventually they'll just stop. Yeah, it's like yeah, a second it's, uh, job if you put it that much. Yeah. There's definitely a, a balance. Uh, Kat and I are a little bit more established than what we were before. And we used to go to a ton of events, but we realized that we go to three, four events a month, then you just kind of get burned out uh, a lot. And it, it's really difficult to maintain that type of attendance for a prolonged period of time. But, uh, you know, younger folks need to get their lives established. And, you know, whenever you get a little bit older, you know, you kind of find this balance where the SA fits in uh, with your life, but it's not the, the only thing in your life that you do. Uh, and it, it just takes a little work to get the balance right for that. Uh, I think as more experienced uh, players and players that have been around for a long time, uh, we put a lot of expectations on the younger folks who come into the game and we, we put them on a path and we want them to get to the end uh, really fast, but uh, it really is journey before destination. And you should let people grow at their own pace and, and not push them uh, if they are putting other things on hold to, to take that path. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a great point. Um, one of the things that I I'm noticing also in the in the answers is that there's more of a social aspect. It's not just about the activities themselves. Um, do you all want to talk a little bit about the social aspect of recruitment and retention? That that's the that only teach? reason I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> like I um my my godmother was in the SBA, and I had like some friends through work and stuff, but um. She knew John, Miguel, and Miles, and she thought I would really get along with them. And I had already knew, I had already known Miguel a little bit um, before the SCA. But yeah, when I, um, you know, started coming out and they worked really hard, like I said, like they were giving me rides. They were like inviting me to hang out with them afterwards. Um, they were like, John would text me and be like, hey, are you coming to practice this week? Do you have a ride? Do you need a ride? Is everything okay? And I'm like, that really like changed the whole thing. Because at first I was like, oh, okay, yeah, sword fighting is cool. <laughs> like, I'll check that out. But there were weeks where I'm like, I just don't feel up to sword fighting, but I do want to go hang out with my friends. And that really like sort of pushed it. Like I would sword fight anyways, because I was there already, but I was there because of the people. Right, and so I was recruited kind of directly into a household and a friend group, and you know, once you get in here, you realize that a lot of people have the same interests as you just outside of like the medical stuff. So, for example, Miles likes Lord of the Rings. If you look at his shirt, um, <laughs> so <laughs> I do cosplay, and it turns out a lot of the people I met were really into superheroes. So, like on my birthday, I celebrated with those people, and we went and saw Shazam. Like it had nothing to do with the SCA. Um, yeah. So, you know, if there's a movie coming out or something, like a Marvel movie that, you know, a lot of people will see, maybe talk in your local group, be like, hey, does anyone want to go see this? Like, here's the online tickets, like, let's all get tickets and go. Um, and that worked really well when I was in college for my Taekwondo team, too. That's how we bonded a lot. We had specific socials that had nothing to do with Taekwondo, so we'd all go see a movie or we'd go 
camping, I guess like in the SCA, we're already camping, but like we'd go do stuff that had nothing to do with, with the sport or the activity. So it wasn't yeah. just knowing them in the context of that. When, uh, when I was down in Corpus, we had a, every Tuesday night, either every Tuesday or Wednesday night, we would always all meet up uh, on a separate day outside of our practice, which was on the weekend. And the same thing, we would all hang out, have some food. Uh, if there was something to work on, we'd work on some armor. If there was uh, some, some, we would go in the backyard and do some training. Uh, and then we would all just sit down and have a good time and laugh and, and enjoy each other's company. So I would, you know, look forward. That would be, I would, you know, have fire practice. And I'd be like, I just got to make it to Wednesday because then we can all hang out again. And I'd think, okay, just got to make it to the weekend because then we can fight again. So, you know, I had friends, you know, I had a big social group in college that I enjoyed hanging out with, but it's a little different. Uh, the, the bonds you have in the SCA are kind of a, a deeper bond because we're, you know, we, we, we do this sport with each other and it's a, it's a little different to have that com camaraderie and that, uh, you know, that, that bond again. So that's something I think is, is very important as well. Yeah, and it's, if you're in a local group, uh, I, now I'm you know, carefully advising right now outside of, you know, the current situation, you know, meet up and say, Hey, let's come over. I'll, I'll bring some, you know, I'll bring this dish. Everyone read up. We all bring something and we all hang out, have some food, hang out, have a good time and do whatever we need to work on. And, you know, I need to say, I need to work on this armor. Someone's going to work on this move or that, you know, meet up with your local people and start, you know, doing, you know, little things y'all can do together as a group together and help each other out, you know, build each other up that way. Yeah. As a recent grad who can't cook and has no money, every time I showed up to someone's house, they would feed me. And Baroness Cat still feeds me every time I show up to her house. And Countess Torin invites me to her house to feed me. And I would be lying if I said that was not one of the top reasons. <laughs> Everything revolves around food for some reason. Very similar. Yeah. 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 Definitely. I was very similar when I was in college when I was first joining. Um, I didn't know how to cook, still don't know how to cook, but people fed me multiple times a week and kept me in the SCA. But that social component and that friendship component is really key to recruiting younger persons in the SCA. Um, we can make friends online all day. Um, we can play World of Warcraft online all day. We can, we can play with swords and watch HEMA videos or whatever online all day. We're very crafty at that. Um, we, can, we can learn about things that you're trying to present all day long. What we need really is the friendship and that face-to-face -face time. And sometimes whenever I'm recruiting younger persons, I know that I'm not going to be that friend for whatever reason. Maybe they just don't mesh with my personality, which happens quite a bit, or maybe our interests just don't align. That's totally okay. What I'm going to do is find somebody for them to be friends with in the SCA and let them know that there are other people here for them to build those social connections with. Because at the end of the day, that's what, that's what keeps everybody in the SCA. And that needs to be our first and primary goal when recruiting and retaining people, because even if they don't join the SCA, you still got a friend out of it. And that's what they're looking for. That's what you're looking for. That's what human beings look for in general. That friendship, mm -hmm. companionship, and that social aspect is what we need to be focusing on. I think a lot of times in the SCA, we, we tend to forget about that. And we kind of look, oh, look how many names we got on this roster. Great. That's cool. But how many of them have you texted? How many of them have you built a built some form of a relationship with. Um, a lot of times that answer is none. Oh, well, we sent them an email from the hospitaler's email address and they didn't respond. Well, of course they're not going to respond. You're just a hospitaler's email address at that point, sending them kind of a blanket statement. You really need to form a friendship with them on the spot. Whenever I'm at demos and stuff, I always try to get their contact info just right there. I pull out my cell phone, I get them on Facebook, I get them on whatever. And I, and I, I try to form that, that personal connection with them immediately and make sure that I jot their names down, et cetera. So that way um, they see, and instantly they have a friend if they show up to their first event. And if I can't provide that for them, say I'm not the right demographic, this, this works for any age group. Um, if, I'm, if I'm not the right demographic, it's, if it's a 60 year old woman who's interested in calligraphy comes out, I'm gonna find somebody who's very similar to that, that, that I know that they're gonna chat and get along with. That's the best person to put in front of them. And that social aspect is really, the key that we have to retention and recruitment and that, that we really need to focus on, especially definitely. with our generation. Yeah, it's definitely like easy at practices. I mean, it, you probably wouldn't have the same thing with something that's more, you know, if you're like talking over scribal or whatever, but like, I definitely know that at practices, you can just like talk and talk and talk about fencing. And I have people at my fencing practice who are like, have been there for forever 
so I'm not worried about them like leaving the FDA but I don't know anything about them like interpersonally like I don't know what kind of movies they like or you know like where they go on vacation or like anything um so like Miles said like having them on some kind of social media or like just making some small connection like there were several people at um a demo that Miles and I did where you know, I like saw the shirt that they were wearing and I was like, oh, I like that superhero too. And then it was like a whole different thing. It's like, we like swords and superheroes. Now we have two things in common and it's like a little bit easier. So yeah, make definitely. sure that you invest in them as a person and not just as a, as an SBA person. Yeah. And she brought up a good point about fighter practices. You know, at our fighter practice um, here in the Orangeburg, we had a bunch of new people coming out whenever I was first coming out and they weren't sticking for some reason. I just couldn't quite put my finger on it. And then one day after we did a big Sam Japan demo, I said, you know what? I'm freaking hungry. Let's go to Whataburger. And then we started going to Whataburger after every single practice. Suddenly our retention rate went from like 10% to like 90, 95% because they were all hanging out with us just outside of the fencing context. So it was that much easier for them to come back the next time. It's intimidating to come back when you go, oh man, I just held a sword or I just swung a stick and I really, really sucked at it. My body hurts really bad. I think this guy tried to hit me in the nuts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I got to censor myself a little bit. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, it's really intimidating to come back from that and come out to a practice again. You got to you gotta go through that prep, the pep talking yourself up again to put yourself out there. It's very difficult for people our age when we can just sit behind a keyboard at home and not have to worry about any of that junk. So having that social interaction after you've already got them there that first time gives them something to come back to. They go, oh, oh Miles, I know Miles. We chatted, he's, he's really weird and into elves and crap. And, and I know that I'm not gonna be the weirdest one there. And it, it works really well to get them to come back. Yeah. I, I think it was like my third time going to practice or something like that. And I was like, okay, like fencing is kind of fun um it's chill like Mike Miles and John are like fine the other people are like chill and then um John was giving me a ride home or me and Mike was and Miles was there and he was like guys I really want Taco Bell I really want to go <laughs> hang out at Taco Bell and so <laughs> it was like we were at Taco Bell until late and knowing that they were interested in talking to me as a person and not just teaching me something like it was great that they wanted to teach me fencing and I really appreciated that but then like also just being able to sit around and like talk about their girlfriends and like what movies they saw and whatever is like I I was like oh okay they like me as a human being as well and so I I have an easier time coming back and I can be comfortable now. Yeah. And there's, there's a change in dynamic whenever you go somewhere else after that, you know, it's very intimidating to come up to uh, master miles Ridley at practice or whatever. And I've got on a $2,000 helmet and holding $600 swords, et cetera. But when Joanna comes to a Taco Bell and I'm just being a freaking idiot uh, spewing off with my best friends about crap and she has places that she can jump in and contribute actively to the conversation, the whole dynamic of that relationship changes and suddenly they see, oh, this is a place where I legitimately fit in. These are just people after all. They're not, they're not um, some untouchable kind of super nerds off in the distance with a bunch of money invested in this game, which is legitimately what young people think of the SCA. And whenever they see it, they go, oh my God, look at all those people in shining armor and stuff. There's no way I can do that. Um, and then you take them out after and especially if you're paying for the food and they don't have any money, they go, oh, wow, this is, this is really for me here. This is great. And they, they want me here. Um, I have something to contribute. So yeah, it's like humanizing, you know, <laughs> they're real yeah. people now, not, not just like these great giant SCA, you know, fighters or scribes or whatever. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I know the time they see people like that is like in movies and stuff, you know, like they, they see Thor or, or some other superhero that's untouchable and et cetera with all of that gear. And so it's got, they have like a subconscious, oh, I can't, I can't be one of those things. Those things are what I see in movies and stuff. That's not real life, but yeah. in reality it's also, all people and they start out as people too. Yeah. Also speaking of like, I, I mean, I know it's a little bit skewed because like you three are really good fighters, but like on top of that, the other people that I knew, Pug and Mathonway had been in it for like 20 plus years. And so it's like, all the people that I knew were like really, really, really deeply invested in the game. And so I felt like, oh God, I'm never, 
I'm not gonna get that far. <laughs> <I'm> just, <"Whoa." laughs> um, and like, you know, so that's five people that I knew and two or even four of them were all already uh, peers. And so I was like, oh God, like <laughs> I'm, I'm never, I'm never gonna get that far down this road. <laughs> um, and being able to like just hang out with them, I'm like, oh, okay. They're also just like my pals. And it was, it's a lot easier. Yeah, the more you can do to set their mind at ease, the better. You know, the first thing that I do whenever somebody comes up to practice is I just kind of give them a little fist bump. I go, hey, what's going on? I'm, I'm Miles. How's it going? And then I just chat and have a conversation with them, not at them. A lot of times in the SCA, people have conversations at people when they're trying to recruit, talking about how, oh, this is what we do, blah, 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 blah. And they don't take the time to say, hey, what are you interested in? You know, what do you, what do you like to do? Um, oh, hey, this, you see you looking at this helmet. Do you want to look at it? Whatever. Um, but it needs to be a two-way dialogue where you're having a conversation with them and anything that you can do to kind of set them at ease and make yourself seem a lot more approachable. And like, they're just talking to another person. That's what you need to be doing. I think what Miles is saying about making them feel comfortable is uh, a big part of it. Like when I went to my first heavy practice, uh, I saw these two people, you know, I was like, oh, cool, sword fighting. And I'm thinking it's going to be the elegant swift. And I see two heavy fighters, boom, boom. And I'm like, oh, whoa, this is pretty intense. And they're like, well, look here, like, this is what we're doing. And they were, they talked with me and they said, you know what, have you done anything? I said, yeah, I've done some martial arts here and there. They got me in armor. And another thing, and this is the part about the intimidation is making it good for them their first time. Like, you know, make, making sure they're, you're not just, if you have someone, uh, that's going to just hit a new person hard or stab in your case, a new person hard that that person needs to be dealt with. Like when I fight a new fighter and I, you know, I can scale up and go as high as I need to against high level fighters. When I'm fighting a new fighter, I almost don't even hit them. I almost just let them beat me up. You know, they're getting nine out of 10 hits are landing on me from them. I'm not worried about them hurting me and, uh, you know, making it fun for them. Cause then it's, Oh, I just, I got to swing this and I had fun and I'll, I got exhausted, but I got to swing and I hit him and it was visceral and it was real versus, oh, some dude hit me really hard and now I have this bruise and I'm never going back there again, which yeah. I can say I have seen happen and then that person never comes back. Not from me, from other people. But. That just comes back to having armor that fits because it's quite scary to see, you know, seven foot tall people hitting each other. If I had not gotten into armor and fought my first practice, before I could like get too scared and cop out, I probably wouldn't be a heavy fighter because it's terrifying to watch and it's loud and they're hitting very hard. And then someone gets hit really hard and does like, oh, and then they lay on the ground for 30 minutes. <laughs> um, but when I was new, you know, they put me in armor and they just let me swing at them and that was fine. And I was like, oh, this is not scary. Like no one's going to murder me. This is fine. I will be a heavy fighter. So. <laughs> I definitely hit John, Mike, and Miles more times in my first month than I have any time ever since. <laughs> Combined, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah. so we do have a few questions in the chat that have come up, and I want to make sure we address those. Um, so a lot of what we're talking about is the social aspect. What are some non-threatening ways that people uh, who are in an older age demographic can, can do some of that outreach and make people feel welcome without coming off as um, you know, awkward or creepy, you know, we, we certainly don't want to drive people away by being, um, you know, our awkward nerdy selves sometimes, right? Um, what are, what are some ways that we can, we can do more of that outreach? <laughs> Torin went and got me a boyfriend, which was nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it, I think it's important to begin with a dialogue with them. Just, just real friendly, introduce yourself to them and then um, make it clear that you are going to listen, not that you're going to be speaking at people. Um, having that two-way communication is very important. And once you open up that two-way dialogue, um, that's where the magic starts to happening. You can start um, seeing whether or not they're interested in what you're saying. And if they're not, that's cool. It's not your job to convince them. Um, it's your job to be a friend to them and try and give them the resources and just have a normal dialogue and make them aware of what's going on not try and beat in their head that you want to join the SCA, you want to join the SCA. Not everybody's going to want to join the SCA at the end of the day. We're a bunch of freaks, right? Um, yeah. you, you really need to have that communication with them. And the, big, the biggest thing is just, just have that dialogue going and being able to read them and not being so persistent on 
this is a new person that I have to get in the SCA. A lot of times people get into that recruitment trap where they're like, I'm here to recruit. That's what this demo is for. I'm going to talk to them and talk to them and talk to them until they join the SCA. And I'm going to make sure that they come out to fighter practice, et cetera, et cetera. When it's really, it doesn't have to be that much, you know, if you just yeah. chat with them, become friends with them, give them the information that they're interested in. Not, I mean, you don't, if somebody would have talked to me about heraldry my first time out, I would have just never came back. Uh, <laughs> they just, they just opened up a dialogue and had a conversation with me about things that I liked. And that was awesome. Just let them talk about things that they like. Um, not necessarily the things that you like about the SCA. You can, you can bring those up, but make sure it's in an organic part of the conversation, um, not, not yeah. forced. And definitely don't like follow them. I know that that sounds terrible, but like if you're having a conversation with them and that conversation has like clearly died down a little bit, it's okay. You can be silent and you don't have to continue trying to probe and talk to them. And mm -hmm. if, they, if they walk away, you don't have to follow them to see if they're still interested and try and continue talking to them. Those are, people have those best, best interests in their mind, but they, um, a lot of times people just want to be left alone, let to process things, especially when they're looking at this whole new world that they, it's very difficult to comprehend. They just need to, need to just chill for a little bit and process. I agree. So, Briar yeah. after practices, because she's the least threatening thing I've ever seen. <laughs> um, and people love dogs. And so this is like, you don't even have to talk to me about the SCA. You can talk to me about my dog. And then because I'm in silly clothes, you will inevitably ask why I'm in silly clothes. And then we can talk about the SCA. And we can still talk yeah. about my dog because she's my favorite. I think like how yeah, I was I, when, oh, go, go on. No, you Like how I was saying, uh, when I find a new person, I let them hit me nine times out of 10. When I'm talking to a new person, I want them saying nine times out of 10, you know, let them talk to me about, you know, what they're interested in. What, what about this is interesting to you? If I just start saying, oh, I love fighting and, and this is the style we do and we traveled here and this is the event we did and at this war I did this, it's going to be way too much. You know, there's a time for that later. And they say, oh, tell me about, you know, oh, you've been to a war, tell me about a war story. That's one thing, but it's about letting that rapport happen and that dialogue and let them talk to you. They're a stranger you know, either walking at some event or walking through a park or saw a video and reached out. So it's just a complete new, new world to them. And if you just overload them with stuff, it's, it's just going to be, they're just not even going to be interested. It's going to be a sensory overload and they're going to look for something else and go back to just sitting at home and being on the computer. If you slowly let them talk and say, yeah, oh, what have you done? Have you done any martial arts? Oh, well, you've done this. You know, let them talk, let them, uh, let that, like Miles said, let it organically build and then start adding in things but you know especially with new people especially their first time I think all of us have a bad habit of wanting to talk too much or maybe that's just me but uh you know let them talk let the other person say what they want to do and if they don't talk a lot and they start asking questions that's when you can come in and follow up yeah whenever yeah, you, you have mean, a new oh go ahead no you <laughs> cool. whenever you have a newcomer yeah. you, you want to figure out what they are interested in I mean you know what you're interested in but you're trying to find something that connects with the, the newcomer. And so in order to learn their interests, you have to let them talk. And uh, you have to add you know, some questions here and there to see where they fit in in the SCA and who you could possibly turn them to that could, you know, they could learn from or, or get to know or be sociable with uh, people that they would fit in with. As experienced uh, players, uh, we know a lot more people. We kind of know the different groups. Uh, we, we should have a better idea of how to integrate uh, newcomers into uh, the SCA uh, because we know so many people. Uh, and that's how we can help as experienced players. It, it's not to, you know, you know, give them all the details of what they need to know all in the first day that they show up. It's to try to figure out uh, their needs and their wants and then gently kind of guide them to where they need to go uh, so that they have the best chance of staying, uh, sticking around. And Joanna, it's your turn. <laughs> go, Joanna. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that, like, um, you can analogize it to, like, this, the same thing that if somebody was talking about, like, a town that they went to, and they're like, this town has this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing, and you should go here, and it has this thing, and you're like, it. and, like, it's not fun for you like I've never been there like this isn't if you if they're like really really pushing you on like you have to go to this place you have to do this thing oh my gosh you have to like go this place a bakery this place like go 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 like gotta do this thing and I'm like I'm like 
I'm not that interested anymore. Like you're talking for 30 minutes nonstop about this place I've never been. I don't like, I'm not invested in this anymore. Like, okay, I like to bake goods and bookstores and they have that, but like, I'm no longer emotionally invested in this because you've talked to me for 30 minutes about this place I've never been. Whereas if you are just like, oh, what do you like? I'm like, I like bookstores. You're like, oh, this is really cute bookstore in this place that I really like. Maybe you should check it out sometime. It's much more like, I'm much more likely to actually be interested in that than somebody just going on the same thing for like everything. If you are like just inundating people with information about all aspects, like I think Scribory is like cool, but I'm not that into Bardic, right? If they talk to me about like Bardic and brewing and cooking and light fighting and heavy fighting and like, all the things about the SCA, which is amazing. Like, I love that the SCA has lots of things, but if you tell me about everything all at once, and like, you can have pretty clothes and we travel and we do this and we do that. It can be, it's so much. It's just so much information. Be like, what do you like? Oh, I mean, I love Lord of the Rings. Oh, okay, cool. Well, we do archery stuff, if you like that, or we have like light fighting, if you like that, or heavy fighting, if you like that, you know? these things <laughs> I also like Lord of the Rings let's talk about it and here Everything are things that are Lord of the Rings. yeah yeah it does <laughs> well that's one of the ways that a lot of people first get started in the SCA it's not necessarily because of a you know passion for historical reenactment right um it, it's about how um you engage with with other people and that's that's one of the key parts of the society that we've talked about a lot um, I, I know that uh, Miles has mentioned to me the difference in trying to get people involved, uh, people who need mentors versus people who need enablers. And I wanted to make sure we touched on that a little bit. Well, can I go, can I have one last yes. point in that last yes. topic yeah, yeah, yeah. about making it to where you don't seem um, like you have ulterior motives or you don't freak sure. people out or yeah. et cetera, whenever you're coming in. So the one last point that I wanted to make is, and it's very, very subtle, but it's something that I think everybody can focus on is make sure that you leave room for the person's agency in your responses. It's very easy for us to go, oh, well, you should come to this event. You should come to this uh, practice. You should do this. You'll love it. You'll love it. But a lot of times that'll freak somebody out. They'll go, why are they trying so hard to get me to this thing? They're already wearing funny clothes. There's a lot of them. Their average age is like 55. This is freaking me out a little bit. But if you leave them agency in your way that you're wording things, it helps out a lot. So you say, oh, we're doing this thing every Wednesday night. Um, you can come out if you want. We'll, we'll have stuff for you there, no pressure, but you can come out if you want. Oh, we have this event this weekend. If you want to come out, you can. Not, oh, you should come out. But you just let them know, hey, if you want to come out, we'll, we can make arrangements. If not, that's totally cool. I mean, I get it. You're an adult. You've, you've got a life, et cetera. But make sure yeah. that you leave that agency in there. I know we all get excited and we want everybody and we think that everybody should participate in the things that we love to do. But at the end of the day, they're, they're human beings and it's their choice. And if you don't in your language reflect that they have a choice, then it seems like you're trying a little bit too hard to get them to whatever you're doing. And then they'll start doubting your motives for that. So yep. if you're too aggressive, it kind of sounds like a cult. And that only <laughs> works for people like Falca. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely heard a lot of people be like, oh, everybody's going to this event. You have to go to this event. Like, you've never been to an event. You have to go to this one. Everybody's going. And then you're like, oh, God. <laughs> Another way to phrase that is like, oh, BAN is this weekend near Houston. It's a really, really good first event. Let me know if you want to go and like we can get you set up with a ride. That's a lot easier to be like, oh, it's a good first event. Well, then maybe I should go to that one. Versus like, oh, I, I have to go. You can't miss this me. one. This is the best one. This was my first event. It was such a good time. You have to come to, yeah, you can't. Get you know? in the car. We're going to BAM right now. <laughs> I want yeah, to address the question is, well, how can we make people feel more comfortable? And if it's not in a demo, say it's someone who reached out online, don't be like, if you're a dude and it's a girl mess, don't be like, come over to my place and we can work on fight. No. <laughs> Groups, large group areas. I know. Uh, public. Yeah, big public group areas. Say, oh, we're having our scheduled weekly thing here oh we're having this demo here don't you know you know and again that's a fluid situation but don't you know if you have to question if you're being creepy you're being creepy uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. don't invite yeah. them to your house that's not not yeah. first thing 
Yeah, yeah, just make sure that they realize they have a choice in whatever you're discussing. Because whenever they feel mm -hmm. like they don't have a choice, that's when they start distrusting you as an individual and distrusting the organization as a whole. So, a and also point. when it Present starts facts, feeling like a job. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's also, there's, there's like, a ton oh, of reasons why you shouldn't do that. Yeah. 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 Anyways, we can, we can move on now. That was my last yeah. thing that yeah. I wanted to add in there. <laughs> So yeah, uh, so Miles, you, you had mentioned to me about the difference between people who need mentors to get involved and people who need enablers to get involved. Can you talk a little bit about what those differences are? Yeah, definitely. This is pertaining to specifically the service arena. Like at what point do you turn an active recruit into a contributing member of the society and et cetera? And there's, it's a very delicate balance, right? With my household, I usually don't allow, well, allow is a strong word. I usually don't uh, push people to come out to business meetings, things like that. Anything where there's service related things for about their first year in the SCA. If they ask me about it and they're curious about it, I'll say, oh yeah, awesome. Yeah, come along if you want. Um, but I won't be like, you should really go to the business meeting if you're gonna be a part of the SCA because they just wanna have fun. It's their first year, let them do that. If they're gonna be in the SCA and they're gonna build these friends, they can be in it for a really long time and they'll, they'll do their service later. It's okay, they can take a year to just chill and enjoy the SCA. But whenever they get to that point where they approach you and they say, I really want to be a part of this, I really want to contribute and give back, you need to know what exactly they need or they've been in it long enough that they, they probably might need to start contributing a little bit um, for their own personal goals or et cetera, you've got to determine whether or not they need a mentor or an enabler, because those are two very different things. Some people need a mentor that's there to help them and assist them in the process with whatever they're doing, really hands-on, show them. These are, these are typically people who are a little bit unsure of what they're doing. You know, you'll, you'll tell they're very, very nervous about it. Um, so they need, they need a little guidance from an experienced player with how to go about those things versus um, somebody that you just need to enable is somebody who's asking, oh, I want to go to the business meeting or, oh, what does that job entail? If they're asking, oh, what does that job entail? Um, and they're kind of excited about it. They probably don't need a mentor with that. They probably just need an enabler. Somebody says, oh, this is the duties of the job. I think you'd be a great fit. And then they'll often just grab that and start running. If you try to mentor somebody like that, they're going to get super frustrated with what's going on because they feel like um, they're not going to do it correctly or you don't think that they're doing it correctly, et cetera. You need to enable that person to proceed forward with the office and they might be better at it than, than you would potentially be. Like for instance, if Katie here is a college student and she's going to be the social media deputy, like why would she need a mentor for that? I mean, this is a 45 year old person in the SCA who's been in it since 1980 going to contribute in any meaningful way to her being in the SCA deputy. No, the answer is no, 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 they're probably not. She just needs somebody to enable her that, that um, reassure her that, no, you can take this position. You can contribute. It's okay. You can do, do whatever you want to do. That's all in your field. She doesn't need a mentor with that job. Same thing with like people who graduate with management degrees. If, if they have a management degree and they're going into an SCA event, they probably don't need a full-time mentor to run a demo. They might need an enabler to say, hey, this is what we've done in the past, do with it what you will, but they don't need you to sit there and hold their hand through every step of the process. That's just going to frustrate them and make them never want to jump back into the service arena ever again. It's so how do each of you, oh, go ahead, John. No, you're good. Go ahead. I was going to ask how, how each of you would self-identify. Do you feel like you're a person who would prefer to have a mentor or someone who needs an enabler? Oh, I, I definitely needed a mentor. Like, <laughs> um, I definitely, definitely needed a mentor um, because I did not, like I said, I didn't start it because I was like so into fencing. I, I really love fencing now and I like a lot of the other things about the SC as well, but I definitely didn't start it because of that. And um, Miles and John both sort of like helped me figure out like, okay, what kind of fencing do you like? What are the aspects? Look at the other things in the SCA. My family made sure to like take me to a lot of dancing and like party stuff and all that stuff to like show me my options more or less. And then once I was like, yeah, no, I think fencing is kind of like my jam. Then also like John and, and Miles helped me like steer that ship. 
because I would be at a loose end if I was just showing up to practice without like tasks and goals. I need somebody to be like, hey, you need to get better footwork, work on that. And I'm like, okay, thank you for telling me I will work on that. Um, but my, like, I definitely have friends. I'm thinking of people in the other kingdom who can't at all. Like if people are like, hey, this is how you have to do the thing. They're like, what, that's how I have to do it? This is, what, are you sure? <laughs> like, are you sure that's not just how it's always been done? I need to have my own space and my own independence and I can't at all. Yeah, for me, it depends on what the activity is. So like for fighting, the reason I have a night is because I'm not good at fighting and I'm not good enough to teach myself. Um, but for social media, I kind of stepped in to work with their excellencies when they stepped up. And I haven't, beyond them asking for one or two things that they specifically want, they haven't had to mentor me. Uh, I feel like Alyn and Kat pretty much know that as a professional in this sphere, I don't need them telling me what to do. So, you know, I run it by them just to make sure we're not breaking any laws. But the steps social media pages are largely just whatever I want to put on there. Um, and so we have a really great laurel in our area, and I posted something the other day. Uh, it was a scroll made with raised braille from copper, and that has over 13,000 views. Like, I didn't need a mentor to get there, but I need a mentor to get to be able to, like, beat Dukes in fighting. Um, so just understanding what they are already good at and what is something they want to learn. Yeah, for us, it's, uh, we realize that uh, Valka had a uh, a degree in this, and this is what she does mundanely. Uh, we weren't the experts in it, so even though we had more experience in the essay, we were going to tell her how to do it. Uh, and she does run stuff by us, and most of the time we're like, go go ahead and do it. Uh, people who are newer to the essay tend to have a lot more enthusiasm for it, uh, and they want to do their part to make it better. And I think as experienced players, we should let them do that. Uh, we all made our marks in the SCA by doing whatever it is that we did, but we shouldn't uh, impose on the younger folks and we should let them find their own path as well and not inhibit them if they want to do something that they think uh, would be helpful. So you personally yeah, feel like to be hands -on versus hands -on. It, it depends. Like, oh, we should get online to recruit people. We don't have any young people. Someone tells me, like, oh, we don't recruit online. I'm like, yeah, I know. I just said that we should recruit online because you don't. And that's why you have no young people. Like, I know that you don't recruit online. That's why I'm telling you you should do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the things you have always done are not going to get you new people. If you've always done them, you already have everybody you're going to get from doing that. Yeah, so that's why she doesn't need a mentor in that regard. I'm definitely <laughs> on the enable side of the spectrum. I don't really, I don't, I don't do well with mentors. You know, John was was my Don and he's Joanna's Don as well. And he was able to take, he was able to recognize real early in me that I didn't, I didn't really need somebody who was going to um, like grab onto me and like micromanage everything that I do. I needed somebody who was going to enable me to become a good fighter by being exposed to good fighters and, and just being able to chat and dialogue with them. He wasn't really like as struck, nowhere near as structured with me as he is with Joanna and he was able to read that and adjust and that's a big part of what kept me in the SCA you know because um, there were a couple other instances where people were trying to teach me how to do something especially like pertaining to footwork and stuff and I'd been a collegiate tennis player I played since I was six years old I know my body balance and everything and I was just like what are you saying to me <laughs> well you're talking to me about moving my feet and you're about 300 pounds that's not working here so yeah. it's just really identifying who who is willing to do what so yeah i'm definitely on the enable spectrum um even with i was i just got done being southern Renal senestral and um they just had to kind of enable me to go do it they were like hey this position needs to be filled we think you'd be a great job because you're an accounting manager mundanely so you know how to deal with people and it's about conflict resolution and they said um it's mostly about conflict resolution we're not gonna lie to you um it's, it's going to be a little difficult. You're going to have to deal with people on their worst days all the time. Um, but we think you'll do great at it. And so I took the job and I did pretty decent at it and started rumbling. Um, if I had somebody over my shoulder trying to micromanage me, that would not have worked that way. I would have been mad in the first six months and not done it anymore. Uh, I think it goes back to, go ahead. I was going to, I was, you can, you know, I was going to talk about my stuff, which I prefer yeah. to touch, touch on your point later. Oh, here. I, I think it's a, it comes back to listening to whoever it is that you're 
try the newcomer uh, because everyone, you know, some people could use a mentor and some people would like to be enabled, but you find that out by listening to them and seeing what they, they need. And then you adapt to that. Uh, it's, it's not one or the other. How about you, Magnus? Uh, for me, I'm, I mostly prefer, prefer uh, mentorship. I, I feel like uh, I'm, I'm pretty athletic. So in the context of heavy fighting, I can do a couple of things uh, that get me started. But, you know, it, it stopped real quick. And I, I burnt out on, you know, what I could get away with, with just raw athleticism and, and strength pretty quick. So that's where uh, my, uh, my night, Count Krebin, has you know, really helped me. And it's been a thing where I, I can learn something and then do it on my own. So he'll say, work on this, this, and this. And then I'll work on I'll work on that on my own, where whether it's pelling on my own or, or training or working on footwork, you know, I you know, it's if I didn't if I could just walk out and just eat everyone's lunch, then I wouldn't need a mentor, but that's not the case. And until the for, for now, until I'm eating everyone's lunch, you know, I will, you know, know what I know and then know what I don't know, and then uh, you know, take advice until that progresses. So for me it's it's more mentorship and uh, a little bit of enabling me to just go take that and then practice on your own. Cause I can't be over working uh, on a Pell with him every night, but I can take what he says and work at the Pell at my house every night. So mo mostly mentorship for, for me in the context of any fighting, uh, I would definitely need help running events and stuff like that when I eventually get around to that stuff. So that's, that's where I stand on that. Awesome. Um, so thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, we are at a little bit after eight o'clock, so I do want to go through some of the questions from the chat and just try and do some quick hits here so we get folks' uh, questions answered. Um, so we have someone asking, uh, for those of you who have, who have recently transitioned from being a student to being, uh, you know, beginning of your career adult, um, did you have a support system or family there helping you or were you flying solo and doing everything uh, yourself? So I grew up here in DFW and I went to school down in Austin at UT. I moved back here not in the SCA and then had like a couple of my friends in graduate school, but they were in medical school, so I didn't really get to see them. And I was like living with my parents, which is what every 20 year old loves to do. Um, and then I joined the SCA and it was like a bunch of people that were just like, this person has graduated college. She's clearly an adult. She's a poor adult, but she's an adult, you know, invite her to do stuff. And it was like, cool hanging out with adults that I didn't have to ask permission to do things. Um, and then in terms of translating that to SCA career, I did almost nothing by myself for my first year in terms of getting my armor, like Surf Loki built all of my armor custom because it goes back to how armor that fits people. Um, but he built all of my armor completely custom. I was not flying solo. I had a household like Baroness Cat and Brent Lane were there. Sir Floki and his lady were there, uh, Torin and Carpen, Sven and Timmy. So I had a huge support system of very experienced players, which is not, I think, typical of a new person, but it should be typical that they have people who are like, you know, I'll build you this, we'll teach you to do this. Um, so they, they shouldn't have to fly solo if they don't want to, I think is my opinion. I, uh, I uh, have down in Corpus, that's where my family's from, so I have a support system down there. and. Again, getting in touch with the people up here beforehand, I had a huge uh, support system uh, up here of everyone and to the point where people were saying, no, don't come over. You're going to take care of our team, so don't come <laughs> focus on your school. So it's, it was really nice to have that uh, and then say it's okay to not come to this practice or it's okay to not do this. Take your time. Focus on your studies. Uh, that's my in the case of grad school for me. So it was, uh, you know, I, I and then same thing in the SCA when I was down in Corpus. Uh, Sir Whalen helped me, and uh, and Clayton and a lot of people down there helped me build my armor. My first set when I got up here, uh, Duke Sven and a lot of people helped me get my second set going. So for me, it's it's definitely not been a flying solo. I've very much been part of the pack up here, part of the herd up here, and uh, no pun intended. Uh, and so I've had a big, huge support system up here. Yeah, with me, um, my family and I didn't really talk too much when I was in college. Um, I'm very different from them. They're very um, like like jockey. They like sports and everything. And I, I don't like the sports ball. I just don't like the sports ball at all. Um, so whenever I, I moved back in with them after I graduated for about a week and a half and I said, I got to get out of here. I can't do this anymore. Bye. I don't want to talk to you guys for another year. Don't, don't talk to me. 
So my SCA family like really stepped in there at that point. I was very lucky to have a solid group of friends. I've been playing for about a year and a half or two years at that point that had crossed the line into family with me um, in Bringalad. Like I mentioned Mr. Squineth earlier, Mr. Smafanway, Avery, John, Miguel, all of them there. They're as close as family to me. I know that any of them would do anything for me. And, you know, it was really tough for me to figure that out because I felt like I was flying solo. But the SCA provided me with that family and that support network that really helped me through that very difficult time. And I was, I was a butt face a lot of time. I was a real jerk a lot of times because I was super grumpy trying to deal and balance with all of that. And they helped me through it all. You know, they, they said, look, it's completely normal what you're going through. I understand if you need to take time off, take time off, but we love you and we miss you. We'll be here whenever you come back. And, and, and I kept going to like three events a week because I'm an idiot, but they always talked to me and, and helped me through all of it. So that, that provided stability and helped me get my footing as an adult in order to do what I needed to do. And then eventually, once I got back on my feet, you know, my, my blood family felt kind of back into place. Um, I could reconnect with them from like an even ground instead of like a, like a top down ground because my SCA family kind of gave me that even footing where it didn't matter whatever else happened, they'd always be there no matter what. So that was very critical for me through that, through that time frame, And that's the impact that people can have on our specific age group with graduating college. Um, even if they move away, you can still have that impact. You know, I, I moved an hour and a half away. I wasn't seeing them all the time, but I was seeing them once on once or twice a month on weekends. And I was still communicating with them very regularly on Facebook. And I knew if I had a problem, I could call them at 2 a.m. and they would pick up. If I needed something, if I was upset or whatever, they, they'd be over at my house in an hour and a half or, or however long. They, they'd do whatever for me. And that was, that was critical in my development as a human being let alone a Scadian. Yeah, I'm in exactly the same boat as Miles. Um, I mean, like I, so I was lucky because like my, uh, my blood family was also like, uh, I'm really close with them. But uh, I was definitely at a point where I felt um, kind of like at loose ends and my blood family was, was very supportive, but at the same time, like I didn't know what to do. I didn't have like, much sort of purpose, I guess, in my life. Um, I'd like started a new job and everything, but I wasn't feeling like focused and I was having like just a lot of stress and I felt like I didn't have any like real friends. Like I had a lot of people that I just sort of knew from like work or plays or whatever, but I didn't have any like real friends. And so having like Mafanwe, who's my like real life godmother, um, and then John and Miguel and Miles, like, uh, there for me and, you know, those late night taco runs, um, and afternoon taco runs and early morning taco runs really is to live fun. <laughs> and, um, it like having them be like a second family to me, um, absolutely 100 percent changed my life like i have a lot of medical problems and i never ever 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 had anybody who is as supportive in my life with the like severe medical issues that i'm going through as the people in my like sca life and it was it genuinely just changed my life so much i think uh kat and i started off mostly by ourselves and it wasn't until she formalized a relationship with uh someone that we built a connection, but you know now that we you know have gone through it, it, it's definitely better if you have a group of some sort. And I think one of our goals as landed, as current landed, is to to be that group. I, I, I don't think that anyone needs to start in the SA and continue on in the SA alone because that is a really tough road uh, being by yourself. Uh, and uh, in you know in our instance, uh, we think that the barony can fill that role where you can build that group if uh, a group isn't available. Yeah, I agree. A Having lot of times, people who are there willing to be a support system is really, really important. Yeah, definitely. It's super important. And a lot of times, just keep in mind, it has to happen organically too. Um, 
like Mofanwe didn't jump on me after one event saying, hey, let me be your mother. Rah! That's not what happened. <laughs> we just That's started not what chatting. happened? No, no, no. It's That's not. what happened to me, but I was too. So. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> well, that's well, finally what happened. That's right. Yeah. But but eventually it grew and it grew and it grew and it went there. And and if that doesn't happen with a specific individual, that's okay. Just find them somebody that they really enjoy spending time with and then let it happen naturally and organically with them. Because you don't want to force these things. They have to be organic for them to have true meaning in somebody's lives. And then sometimes our lives go at different directions and places and everything. And that's totally okay. Um, if you were super close with somebody and then they become super close with somebody else, that's, that's totally okay. It doesn't have to be like an us versus them thing. That's, that's totally fine. As long as they're still having those familiar bonds and all of that jazz, then that's really what we're going for is, is to get them to a place where they're happy in their lives. Again, uh, it goes back to treating, treating these recruits as individuals rather than recruits. They're, they're people. Yeah. They're, they're all Try people. Friends, they're not, they're not, not an recruit. asset. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're, they're friends. They're people. Um, they need to have friends and have people in the SCA. Otherwise, they won't stay. Yeah. Our first so, goal is to make them happy. I think, I think this one is a great question for uh, Valka. Uh, someone is asking, if we were to recruit online, how would we, how would we do that? What would be some of the tools we would use? Yeah, and Alin probably can talk about it too. He and I have been working a lot online to foster the Steph Hellman community. Somewhere, somehow, we got 10 newcomers during quarantine, 10 plus. Some of them are brand new to the SCA. Some of them are transplants from other kingdoms. I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that we were just active. Like, we were doing stuff. Everybody's bored. Whether or not you're in the SCA, like, this quarantine's boring, ultimately. That's why people are getting tired. So, like, we had Warlord, we had Artisan, and it was online, but it was still, like, you got on Zoom and you got to talk to somebody. Um, we had a Newcomers Academy. And there were some transplants there. There was some brand new uh, newcomers. And just being able to talk to them, being like, look, yes, we do have a community. It will be available, you know, once this is over. Uh, we've posted a lot in the group, just things I did the other day. You know, I know we have a lot of new people. Tell us about yourself. So through that, I found like three new people interested in heavy fighting. Um, so you're just being active, being like, look, we exist, like have events online. I think is probably what helped us the most just because there's nothing happening and Facebook will suggest like, hey, here's a bunch of events near you. You should attend them. Um, so Facebook will advertise for you. Put your so uh, I, I definitely think that there's uh, a lot of, I guess right now because of COVID, there's a lot of negativity, uh, negativity. A lot of people keep saying that, you know, nothing's happening. Well, if nothing's happening, then nothing's gonna happen in your area uh, too. Uh, you're not recruiting anyone and you're not doing anything to help uh, things get better or grow. You, if the content isn't there, you have to make the content. You have to find different ways to engage people. Uh, you have to adapt and, and change to the situations because are we really going to go a year not doing anything because we can't meet in person? That seems like the wrong approach if we want to you know, build something. Uh, you can't just let a garden go without water or anything for a year and expect it to grow. So, you know, you, you have to do something. Uh, Valka made a bunch of posts to try to engage newcomers and to recruit them and to bring attention to uh, the steps into the SCA. And I, I think that's how you go about it. Uh, we, the SCA doesn't have a lot of online content because we are an older generation, I guess. Uh, older, older group that doesn't put a lot of stuff out online. Uh, and, you know, nowadays, if I want to see something, I go to YouTube or I, you know, go to a website. Uh, things have changed way beyond just going to a park randomly and finding some people fighting. Uh, you know, we get a lot more reach online. And uh, the more we build our online presence, the more people learn about us and all the cool things that we do, uh, the more, the easier it will be to recruit people. Uh, because we'll have, you know, things that we can point to. It's like, oh, they did this back then, or here's a video here. Uh, you know, we, we want to make things accessible so that newcomers, you know, could learn more about us online. And so they feel a little, a little bit more comfortable with us and not think we're a cult. <laughs> 
So how about how about someone from not steps, uh, Miles or Leandra? Do you have any suggestions about engaging folks online? I'm kind of a boomer when it comes to technology. <laughs> I mean, I just learned, I just got onto Discord and I've been playing World of Warcraft since like 2006. Uh, <laughs> the good old Ventrilo, which if you're a gamer, you know that that's- But do you like recruit anyone technology. on World of Warcraft? Uh, do I recruit? Yeah, sometimes I, I talk to people on Discord now. I used to talk to people on like Vent on it. Whenever it was there, I just kind of just chat with them. It it goes back to the same thing, right? You just got to make a friendship with them virtually or online, figure out what they're into um, based on what they're saying and all of that jazz. Um, what we do in my group is we have different pages for a lot of things. So for instance, um, we have a Facebook messenger group that started out with just all the young people in the barony which was like four at the time whenever i first started it to where we could just send memes back and forth it wasn't particularly about the sca it was just people that were in the sca and we just send memes back and forth to each other which if you don't know what a meme is that's like a graphic little thing that's funny it doesn't it doesn't mean anything it's meaningless it just makes fun of crap so we we sent those back and forth and etc and then it blew up eventually into my newcomer's household where we've got 30 plus people now shooting memes back and forth to each other and chatting about SCA junk and getting together and going to events and et cetera. So it's really about building that friendship with people, even online. Um, I know it's very difficult to do that if you're not kind of practiced in doing that, but just kind of put yourself, if I was in um, an in-person conversation, how would I go about that conversation and kind of gauge your online interactions kind of in that way. Facebook's a powerful tool for that. Um, uh, other tools, you know, we mentioned Discord earlier. Um, it's, it's, there are groups with Discord. I think Bring a Lot has a Discord and there's, we actually had somebody in Bjornsburg join because there was a Discord group for the SCA at large or something like that, that I have no idea about. And he came up and oh, he was like, yeah, I heard about uh, it on Discord. I was like, what is Discord? And <laughs> so when in <laughs> Discord. Yeah, exactly. So it's like um, uh, over a hundred thousand people on this. There's a lot of people on that Discord. The yeah, there's a ton. Yeah, the I resources that... are out there. You just gotta mm -hmm. gotta learn about them, get on them, and and make sure that things are happening organically, not forced. And I think that like leads into the last question that I that I got um, is what sort of groups are out there for that sort of networking purpose for young adults? So uh, apart from maybe your kingdom or your baronial group. Uh, what are some some resources and such that you know of that folks could join and interact? All right, it looks like Magnus has one. This is uh, for the fighting, not just heavy, but light fighter, any fighter. Mm -hmm. There's a group called the 100 Day Pell Challenge on mm -hmm. Facebook where we post every day for 100 days. And if you do 100 days, uh, 100 shots a day for 100 days, you get the title of a reefer. And you can do a second round, a third round, uh, I'm currently on my fifth round of uh, doing that, and it's a thing where we post our, you know, we post what we do. Some people take videos. We comment. We ask for help. That's a big one. There's also the virtual fighter practice, where a bunch of dukes from all over the known world post a bunch of amazing content, do interviews with dukes. Uh, you can post anything. Hey guys, I'm brand new. What's something I can do? And you will have, you could have the best fighter from any given region helping you out. So the, the Pell group, it's called the 100 Day Pell Challenge and the virtual fighter, uh, virtual fighter practice are two resources any fighter, light or heavy, can use to go. And, and those are both on Facebook? These are both on Facebook, yes. So those are two. I would encourage everyone to go uh, check those out. Yeah, there's there's also a virtual academy of rapier that's um, specific for rapier as well. Similar concept where people are posting a whole bunch of classes. Um, I want to clarify the question a little bit. Are, are, is the person asking the question asking about a place to throw young people out once they get them, like a group to throw young people out or a place to go and seek out young people? I think both. Both? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, are there any groups to seek out young people in the SCA? I don't know. That's kind of why we're having these panels, right? To kind of grow that. I think I think my household might be the biggest collection of young people in the kingdom at this point. I don't know. Um, if you want to throw anybody my way, um, I'll, I'll be had to, happy to add them into the Bjornling chat is what we call it because we're from Bjornsburg and we like to call ourselves little bears. Uh, <laughs> making, making little jokes at the uh, older people. So we say Bjornlings. Um, so yeah, I, I'm 
feel free to throw them at me and I'll throw them in the group text if uh, if they legitimately need like young people to interact with if they're going a little crazy and you don't think that they're going to stick in the SCA. I mean, I think that's the same for anybody on this panel. Um, just go ahead and throw them at any of us. Um, yeah. There's there's not a huge contingency of young Skadians. That's why, that's why we're doing all of this stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, I know we've gone over time a little bit, but I think it was a really good discussion. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. I hope that uh, everyone watching uh, got something out of it and enjoyed it. And if you have some ideas or topics uh, that you'd like us to address, address on a future session in the series, I, I think we'd be happy to get another one going. So uh, I know what Miles said, if there's any young people watching this or know of any young people, throw them at any of us. You know, you can find all our personal pages. I am all She's all over the place everywhere, <laughs> always. So if you know someone that's young that needs someone to talk to or anything, any one of us, you know, just get in contact with us. We'll be more than happy to help. All right. Yeah, we might well, even know young persons in your area. So yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely reach out to us. So. I know well, thank you, everybody. Green. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Have a nice see, see you, see you Thank you, guys. Thanks.